Welcome to the Western Bowl podcast series with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of the series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled Staying in Love. The talk was given by Vijay Fedorshak on November 18th, 2023 via Zoom. Vijay is the author of The Shadow on the Path and Father and Son, and is the organizer of the Western Baul podcast series. This talk is based on the teaching of the French master Arnaud Desjardins, who has written in his book, Ever-Present Peace, that love is a stable state of being, more than something that exists in one relationship, and that it is not possible to realize this state if we have an unloving attitude towards anyone. Vijay speaks about practically working with the principle of loving enemies that exist in different traditions, and about working with the unfriendly or unfavorable side of life. Two songs are played at the end of the talk, All There Is to Say by Liars, Gods, and Beggars, and Yours Alone by Lee Lozowick. If there is benefit in this talk for you, please consider sharing the link to it or writing a review on social media or on one of the podcast platforms. Vijay Fedorshak. Tonight, the topic is Staying in Love. It's titled based on a chapter by the same name in a book called Ever Present Peace by Arnaud Desjardins, who was a French master. He died in 2011, and he was quite a notable figure in the spiritual scene in Europe and someone with quite a lot of being. Maybe I would say a little bit about him to start. His father was a devout Protestant. I read somewhere that his father worked for Peugeot, the French car company. As a child, Arnaud was interested in religious subjects and theater. And he went to the most reputed drama school in France. He met a woman in his 20s and got engaged to her then got tuberculosis, and the engagement was off. I'm not sure if that is really the catalyst for him embarking on the path, seriously or not. I really don't know enough about his history to say for sure, but what I have heard is that he began voraciously reading material about Gurdjieff and about Hindu masters. He got a job in a bank for a while. Then he got a job working for French television. And he took a trip by car from France all the way to India. I don't even know if you can do that these days. But he wanted to find some of the masters that he had read about and heard about and have a firsthand experience of them. And he filmed them some of the most notable spiritual figures of his day, including Swami Papa Ramdas and the Dalai Lama and Ananda Mayama. He filmed them on a 16 millimeter camera with only the help of the woman that he ended up marrying. And then he would come back to France after filming and put together a documentary, which got shown on French television and was really well received. So he became a notable figure on the scene in French television for several documentaries that he produced. He got to know some of these and work with some of these teachers pretty directly. And Ananda Mayama supported him going to find a teacher in Bengal named Swami Prajnanpad. And he worked as his student, as Swami Prajnanpad's student, for many years did some intensive sadhana, and had a breakthrough. And Swami told him that his true calling was passing on the teaching. 
He started an ashram in France, which has moved a couple of times and is now at Oatville in France. It's quite a place where practitioners gather from all traditions. So he wrote this book, Ever Present Peace. The translator notes that Arnaud said that it was part of his spiritual legacy. What he really wanted to communicate to his students And I think beyond just his students, the essence of what he felt was most important to practice with in language that people can understand. So this one chapter, Staying in Love, really has impacted me. And I just felt that it would be a good topic. And I hope that you find the material useful as well. So. Tonight, I would like to talk about love as a stable state of being. I think that actually, in one way, that description is a description of the culmination of the path. I mean, you could describe the culmination of the path in a lot of different ways, in terms of being, non-identification, being moved by the forces of the universe, however you might describe that. but. The way that he describes it really makes sense to me. And it's something that I would like to work with. So to get to this idea of love as a stable state of being, let's talk about love in coupled relationships. Let's talk about love of others, of people that we associate with. Let's talk about love in relationship to life with its favorable and unfavorable aspects. Let's talk about love of the divine, which is really a stretch when you see everything that goes on in the world. There are some very challenging ideas about this. And I won't just refer to some of Arnaud's ideas, but also some of Swami Paparandas's ideas in doing that. And then also let's talk about what it takes What's required of us to move toward being in a stable state of love? So, love with a partner. Why people get together? Gosh, there's a lot of reasons. Financial reasons, social norms. People would like to have a family, intimacy, companionship, children, and love. But if we're honest, Orno says, when We say, I love you. What really we mean is, I want to be loved by you. That's something to contemplate because we fall in love. And if you really fall in love, I don't know that you can really fall out of it, but it happens so often. After the honeymoon, relationships can take many different forms cohabitating, a cult of pairs dynamic, where there's a real codependent thing going on, and dynamics where both partners are really working on themselves with all that comes up in relationships. And a lot of what comes up, I think, is that we have expectations of our partner over time. So yeah, there's this idea like, I love you, but I really want to be loved by you also, or maybe even predominantly. And so we have expectations on this person to do that. And if they don't meet our expectations, we can get upset. (laughs) We can hold a grudge. There can be some resentment. And that happens pretty regularly, I think, in relationships. My wife died three and a half years ago. Since then, I've thought about so many things that have gone on in our relationship. And for a period of time, this was more of a factor. We had kind of a division of labor. You know, I really felt like we built love over time by working on ourselves honestly. But along the way, there are these things. I would provide for the family, and she would take care of the kids and the house. It wasn't like I never participated in that. I did, but that was how it went. She made food for me. I would go to work with a little lunchbox and 
it was wonderful. And then every once in a while, there were other things that were on her plate, so to speak, that made it so that there was no lunchbox. (laughs) I remember we wouldn't get into big fights about it, but inside there was this annoyance about that. You're not living up to your part of the bargain. In some cases, maybe you've been in situations like this, or you know people who have been in situations like this where things have started out looking great with love in the relationship, and then it turned south, and love actually turned into hate or something like that. And the way things are these days with the media at our fingertips, any situation where famous people get into situations like this gets publicized all over the place. In news online, there is all the dirt about people like Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, who fought like cats and dogs on his private jet before they got divorced, and Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. I mean, I never followed this, but I'm thinking about this in terms of this topic. He sued her for $50 million. He said that she defamed him by saying that she was a public figure representing domestic abuse as though he was an abuser. And he sued her for $50 million for saying that. And then she comes back and countersues him for $100 million. And the cameras are in the courtroom and all of this crazy circus thing going down. I don't need to go into the details. It's the point of how love can turn. And is that really love? Or we can think, if I only found the right person, just haven't found the right person, but are we really looking at ourselves and how we contribute to the situation that's not working? In relationships, love can grow if we work on ourselves. You know, am I controlling? Yeah. <laughs> can I push the pause button on that? Can I relax that a little bit? Am I adaptive? Am I jealous? But even if over years we really bond with our partner, if we're in a relationship, Is that enough? Is it enough to have a really fulfilling, satisfying relationship? I read a transcript of a talk that Arnaud gave. It's not included in this book, Ever Present Peace. But he says in this talk that Swami Prajnanpad, his teacher, told him to work with the question, what do you really want? So I'd ask you now to think for a minute. What do you really want? And that could be in almost any domain. But then Arnaud says the follow-up question, and if you got that, would that be enough? And he says that if you really explore that, probably not. So what is enough? If I have this relationship, that relationship will sometime end. If I get the job that I would like. I'm working in the field that's very satisfying to me. There will come a time when that will be over. What is ultimately enough? Arnaud says, open up to the idea of a kind of love that becomes a permanent state of being. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't see another answer to that question. What do you really want that actually is enough than that. That's how it's occurred to me these days, because it's been very clear, especially in the last three and a half years, that anything that I really want in this relative world is not enough. He quotes a well-known saying in this chapter, Staying in Love. The sage loves like the fire heats and illuminates. This is a Eastern saying, the sage loves like the fire heats and illuminates. In other words, the fire doesn't discriminate about who you are, what the situation is. It heats the criminal. It heats someone who's committed domestic violence. It heats everyone and lights up everything, regardless of who you are. And we read about, we can read about, 
different figures in different traditions who are described as doing that. If you see a picture of Ramana Maharshi, or you read a book about Ramana Maharshi, everybody says that just to sit in his presence was overwhelming in some ways. Probably there were people there who weren't receptive to that and didn't experience it that way. But so many people describe his gaze and the love that he exuded as a permanent state of being. I have such vivid memories of sitting with the Indian master who many of you may have just heard his name or may not have ever heard his name, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar. Just sitting with him blew me away. Every time. So I'm on four different trips there, and every time he was like that. And I took it somewhat personally at the time, foolishly, because I felt, oh, there's something about Western people coming to visit him or something that evokes this. But everybody said it. Everybody. There's so many stories. Indians, Europeans, Americans, everybody who went to him speaks about the power of his love just existing in that place. So my question is, of course, how do you get there? Or what's what's going on with that? Even if I check myself and am not ambitious in terms of me wanting to get somewhere, I'm suffering. <laughs> The world is suffering. It seems like maybe that's enough. What needs to happen to live from that place? So let's talk now a little bit about relationship to other people. Many of us are in coupled relationships where we have been. But love is about more than just one man and one woman. For sure, we have special feelings for certain people. There's nuances to love, but there's many kinds of love. Those of you who have children know this. Those of you who have parents know this, (laughs) which is, of course, everyone. Those of you who have friends know this. There's different kinds of love. There's different shades of it. And those of you who have pets may know it, but I don't know that kind of love, I have to say. That's not been the kind of love that I have experienced. I grew up in a housing project and pets weren't allowed. But I have to say, I'm warming up to it a little bit because I work as a therapist at a residential treatment center, and they've just recently gotten some therapy dogs. And they actually have pulled at my heart a little bit. Except last week, this one therapy dog barfed all over one therapist's office. And I realized, oh, that's one of the reasons why you're not really all excited about loving pets, but people tell me about it all the time. They're so loving. They're so unconditionally loving. All right. But listen, then there are those that we do not love. So I'd ask you to think about, are there people or is there someone in your life that it's not all that great? There's some tension or there's some grudge or resentment or something in the way. Up where I work, there's this one person, every time that I need to talk to her, she gets on her phone and then she starts talking and I stand there for minutes waiting for her to get off the phone and she will not look at me. She ignores me. I don't know what is going on about that, but it's building up and it's annoying. And I realize that she's got something going on with me. I don't know what it is. But then I start observing myself. I notice I'm a little bit edgy with her. Oh, less so recently because I've been working with this. And also somebody I know has asked me, he's asked me a couple times, why are you doing what you're doing? It's kind of a veiled criticism. And I realize that there is some unlove that I have in me toward these couple of people, it's not a big thing, but it's there. It's been more difficult with my father. He's no longer alive, but that was more difficult. So Arnaud says that if we're going to consider the possibility of the path, we have to consider love your enemies. 
And anyone who you have a relationship of unlove with, we look on as an enemy. We might not describe them that way, but in some way, that's how we hold them. He quotes Jesus, who better to quote, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Wow. That's in some other universe to feel that way in the situation that he was in. Wow. He also said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. And society tells us to do just the opposite, just exactly the opposite. The Israelis and the Palestinians, I was listening to an interview on NPR with some Israelis in the West Bank, settlers, not so great. And then, of course, Palestinians, the Hamas faction killed all these people. And I don't know if you're following this. I have recently things that are going on in Congress, people walking through the hallways of Congress, elbowing each other, actually getting physical with each other and during hearings calling each other out, asking them to stand up. You want to go at it? We do not learn to love our enemies at all. But on the other hand, there are examples of this. Ono refers to a Tibetan Rinpoche who was held by the Chinese. And he was released when things calmed down politically for a little while. And he had an audience with the Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama asked him, were you ever scared? And the Tibetan Rinpoche said, I was scared that I would not love the Chinese people. And also, when Arno was leaving, after filming some of these Tibetan practitioners and Tibetan masters back in the 60s, He uh, met with the Dalai Lama just alone. No TV cameras, nobody else there. Just he and the Dalai Lama. And he asked the Dalai Lama, is there any instruction that you'd have for me or any request as I go back to make this documentary film on the Tibetan Buddhist practice here and the masters that are here with you? And the Dalai Lama said one thing. Never talk badly about the Chinese. So Arnaud says that progression on the path denies us the right not to love what we consider non-lovable. So this talk is about staying in love, in a permanent state of love. And what we might need to do and look at. We observe ourselves in a lot of different ways, but maybe there are areas that could use a little more attention. So then, love not just for others, but for life with its favorable and unfavorable sides. So let's go even deeper with this idea of enemies. So we see situations as friendly or unfriendly, favorable or unfavorable. If people are complimentary to me, that's a very favorable situation. If people are not complimentary, that's an unfavorable situation. And it seems like we are looking for favorable situations all the time. That's what we gravitate toward. But he asks, will there ever be a time when there'll be only favorable situations? He says that love your enemies implies that you completely change your attitude in relationship to the unfriendly side of existence. Okay, so now here we're getting into it. To stay, to reside in a stable state of love. He's saying that it's necessary, it's a law, that we would have to love our enemies. And that would include the unfavorable side of existence. So that's a lot. And he says that everything, no matter how small, that represents the unfriendly side of existence is the enemy. The enemy is all that affects me daily, upsets me, hurts me, disappoints me, and spoils my existence. Little things, no matter how small, 
represent the unfriendly side of existence and is fertile ground for us to practice in. And most of the time, I think we do not even consider that. At least I don't. So I'm thinking about this. This is really what got me into doing this talk, is that I really wanted to consider this more deeply. So I just sat down all of a sudden and just started writing down small things that, to me, represent the unfriendly side of existence. Okay, I have to do my wash. I'm not happy about that. I didn't want to get up. I'm just tired. I don't want to get up. I forgot my water bottle at home. I drove to work. I forgot my water bottle. I bought mushrooms, but I didn't need mushrooms. I had a whole box of mushrooms, and I forgot about it. I go to the gym. Somebody's on my exercise machine, and they're just sitting there on their phone, and I'm ready. You know, I don't have much time. I'd like to use that machine. My printer, it's not printing. It just stops. I'm working, and somebody comes in and interrupts me and starts talking to me or calls me on the phone. I'm busy now. I can't find my phone. Where is the thing? I can't call it because I don't have a phone to call it. I went to the store. I'm into sparkling water. I like sparkling water. And I just grabbed some bottles and came home. It's still, it's not sparkling. I go to Sprouts. I like a half a banana every day. They're all green. I mean, really green. It's going to take a while. I go to work. And the parking lot that they have recently paved, there's fewer spaces than usual. And this person parked way over the line. I mean, way over the line. So I can barely squeeze in there. I go to natural grocers for almond butter. That's why I go. I go for the almond butter. They don't have any. I just dropped a spoon on the kitchen floor. Who's going to pick that up? I eat some little sesame thing and something is caught in my throat. (laughs) And I just can't stop coughing. He says that the main point is the about face that we can do. He says, you must not miss this opportunity to practice, to do a turnaround in attitude. Often this doesn't ever cross my mind. It doesn't even cross my mind. I'm just reacting. And even later on, I don't reflect on that. I'm just focused on the next thing that I need to do that's so important. And I miss, oh, there's just some unfavorable or unpleasant side of life that just showed itself for an instant. And maybe I could have changed my attitude about that. Maybe I could work with that rather than complaining. You go up to the Grand Canyon and it's overcast. Well, does that mean that you have to have a bad day? Maybe it's the people that you're with that you could be in communion with and have a good day, regardless of whether you can't see the thing. There's lots of pictures. So does anything pop out at you in terms of these kind of things? Is there someone that you have a grudge with or you have some resentment toward? Or is there some situation, unfriendly or unfavorable, that you could work with? Hi. Well, I just wanted to say that I'm in a self-observation group, and (laughs) it's really work. (laughs) It's a lot of work to try to stay in that being in love. I find it's pretty easy when I'm by myself or in nature, but enter human beings and all they bring with it. And it's really hard for me to do this, particularly with the negative thoughts of they are my enemy. They're not. (laughs) I know they're really not. I do have to tell this story. So it was last Sunday, and it was a beautiful day, so I went for a bike ride on the trail, and I got a new bell on my bike, which is plenty loud. (laughs) My other one, nobody could really hear it, so I got a different one. So I'm passing this young lady who is walking, and 
I rang my bell once and announced my arrival on your left. She got annoyed and she made this gesture with her hand and I couldn't really understand what she said, but it was something derogatory. I could tell by the tone of her voice. So I just waved at her on the way by and passed her. Well, I did my mileage and I turned around to come back and she was walking in the same direction. We were the only two on the trail visible. And again, I didn't want her jumping out in front of me and running over her or something. And there's many reasons why you ring your bell. And so I rang my bell and said, on your left. And she <laughs> she gave me what for. She yelled at me. And she said, we are the only ones out here. That's not necessary. I lost it. I went out of love. <laughs> I went into the raging bee. <laughs> I didn't say anything profane, but I said, it is necessary. <laughs> Read the rules. And I felt badly for losing it. I could have practiced with her twice. But the second time, I lost it. and. I probably pedaled for five minutes feeling badly. And then I just started laughing because what else can you do? One thing that Honor says is don't demand from yourself today what you cannot realistically expect. Yeah. Then you will not love yourself. So I think that we have to have a lot of compassion for ourselves too. This is a practice long term. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And we'll fail. We'll fall down again and again. But the idea of doing this turnaround and of not always looking for favorable situations, if God, so to speak, or if the divine is everything, the favorable and the unfavorable, well, then to be in relationship with all that, to be open to all that, is really an aspiration. And it requires a lot of revising the way that we function as primates about survival. So, okay, these are relatively small things. You're driving down a bike path and somebody gives you the watch for, or I drop my spoon on the floor. Okay, not such a big deal. But what about when the unfavorable side of life shows up in really serious ways? What about pedophiles? What about murderers? How do you relate with those? And Arnaud is insistent that it's just not possible to realize the fruits of the path if you have an unloving relationship toward anyone or anything. Oh, my God. But he has this caveat, and he insists on it, he says, that that doesn't mean approval of behaviors at all. But in terms of compassion, that's a different story. But then what about really serious disasters? How can we hold that as an expression of God's love or the love of the divine? That doesn't seem to make any sense. So I want to shift and speak about something that Swami Ramdas has written about. He was one of the great masters from India in the 1900s. And he says, God is all merciful. He really experienced that, it seems. And pray to him. When he makes you pass through many a painful ordeal of life, it is only to awaken you to the ultimate reality. Pain and sorrow purify your heart and free you from illusions. Then it is that you are eager and earnest in your quest for an existence beyond the tribulations of this world. I don't know about you, but when serious loss has happened for me, I have just felt I need to dig deeper. If I'm going to pull myself up, I'm just going to have to go deeper with this. What worked before, it's just not working anymore now. I need to search, look more into what's really going on here and adjust my attitude. He says that every tradition says that there's something in us that has to change. So I can't forget that. These days, what passes as spiritual life a lot is everything that's light that's favorable, but the things that are unfavorable, we need to digest too. So how am I going to do that? I refer to what he's written and let this work on me. Perhaps 
I can't demand this from myself right now. I can't realistically expect it, but I can let that work on me. So he says also, sages illumined with wisdom proclaim that the worlds are God himself in manifestation and the entire aspect of it is Lila or play. The worlds are God himself, including the earthquakes and the tornadoes and the hurricanes and all of that. So how does that reflect God's mercy and love? He says, difficult indeed for the rationalist to reconcile these workings of God with his attributes of love, mercy, and peace. Still, the mystic sage maintains that it is all God's work and all for good. For suffering and sacrifice soften the heart of man and free it from pride, passion, and ignorance, the essential thing needed for his liberation from the thraldom of the individual sense and its fetters. I can grok that conceptually, but to bring it into the body, that's transformation. Maybe it's too much to consider it in a global sense, but can we consider it in an individual sense? So for me, my wife died. And I would do pretty much anything to reverse that, but it's not happening. And I have to admit that it has opened me in ways that nothing else ever has. I mean, there's heartbreak that I don't think is going to end. And usually when we think about heartbreak, we think about mending it up. How can you mend a broken heart and all of that? But I don't see it that way. I see it that there's an opening here. And I can see that suffering and sacrifice soften the heart of man. So he says that being settled in love is not for the other person. You meet somebody on the bike path and they cuss you out. It's not for that person that maybe you smile and say, I'm sorry to have disturbed you, whatever you might say. It's not for that other person. He says that it's actually for you. The more that you're settled in love, the more you are happy. He says that you cannot at once be settled in this condition of bliss you are so longing for and at the same time keep a non-loving emotion for anyone. And true love is a stable state of being toward which practice leads us little by little. With those two people that I mentioned, one that I work with at the residential treatment center, I go up to this person who's on her phone and I'm standing there and I'm breathing. And then when she finally gets off the phone, she doesn't look me in the eye, but I say, hey, can we talk about this? And little by little, I'm developing a relationship with this person woman and it's getting better i don't think she likes me and it doesn't matter but i'm not walking around with this self-talk going on that doesn't reflect happy thoughts and with this other person who was pretty critical of me i make it a point when i see this guy to talk to him ask him what's going on i hear that he's traveled someplace How was that? What happened? And we're developing the relationship. That's actually pretty nice. He talks to me first these days. And I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding that sometimes goes on and projection for sure between people. And it doesn't matter what people do to me so much. And that is how I respond to them. And I'm just focusing more on that aspect of inner work that I've tended to discount a little bit. He says, or no, try opening to love in this way with a strong intention to succeed, exclamation point. Do not make of it something impossible. I insist that this is in your own interest. Every day we have the chance. Anyone else want to say anything? Do you see how it might be useful? to change an attitude towards someone or to some situation that represents the unfriendly aspect of life? And if so, how could you do it? How could you work with it? I'm sitting here getting all triggered on all these things. My mother died this year, and 
she and I had had a really intense relationship. She did not like my spiritual path at all and would never let me forget it. And one day I knew it was up to me because she was in her 90s, 96 when she passed. And I knew it was up to me to help this relationship because she had lost the presence of mind to be a partner to help cure this relationship. And what helped me was recognizing this was her pain. And she was trying to get rid of her pain by putting it back on me. And I had never really listened to her pain. I was defensive. Well, that was 40 years ago or anything to get rid of it rather than just listening. This is her pain. And I traced it down and I gradually found my behavior had embarrassed her. I went, wow, that I could relate to. I could feel compassion for her. I found what button was being pushed. And I sincerely apologized to her. And it was like a light went on. And it really was that quick. She just went, well, she wasn't mean to me after that. Her goodness came out at that point, And it was just better. And so when she passed, I felt we had done everything we could to repair that relationship. And it involved me changing so much over the years because this took years of work to get to the point where I could really hear her and really empathize with what she had gone through. It's so great that you did that before she died. Yeah, it was good. I have a friend who's got two kids that she's estranged from, and she's not in good health. And some of us have this tendency to want to rescue other people, and I really need to check that and make some boundaries and limits. But I felt it important to take a step in and just say, hey, is this how you want to go out? What could you do? I don't know if any of you are familiar with the landmark work. It used to be EST back in the day. One of the things that they have you do, which I found really great, was they would say, call somebody on the break. Resolve it. Just call somebody that you need to forgive or that you need to apologize to. And people would do that, and they would come back all buzzing. It takes a bit. The phones ring. Maybe you just get their voicemail. But if they answer, wow, you haven't talked to this person maybe in a decade or more or less. But there's something between you that's not resolved. Do it. It's not possible to realize the fruits of the path if you have an unloving attitude toward anyone. I get that. So to me, this is really important. A couple more things. He says that existence, duh, is fundamentally disappointing. Everything is going to go. If we don't want to remain unhappy, something in us has to change. He says that that's a happy statement. How is that happy? Uh, he says it's happy because there would be no possibility of letting go of suffering if it depended on other people, but it depends on you and me. It depends on us. But maybe I have too much pride. Or maybe I want to be right. It's the same thing. And I'm not willing to do that. If you really look at it this way, maybe I want to suffer. But if you want happiness, well, then we'd have to do this turnaround, he says. So as I mentioned, I work at this residential treatment center for teenage girls, tremendously traumatized. And I run an emotion regulation group. I've done this for years. Actually, I'm not running it at this exact time, but this is rare. And I ask kids in these groups, how many of you have family members who haven't spoken to each other in a long time, who are really holding grudges? And every time, every single kid has a hand going up. 
So we can't do anything about other people necessarily, but we can do something in our own lives if it's important to us. He says, you've got the secret to get out of suffering. Rather than remaining angry, have the audacity to remember the supreme aim. I would describe that as staying in love. He said that if you do this, more change is possible than might be possible by unskillful practice for 15 years. You might practice and practice and practice whatever practice is for you and still not see real transformation in terms of the ability to stay in love. He says that it's now that the game is played. Our only chance to be free is to love our enemies. Jesus knew what he was talking about. I never really got that. I got that on the most gross level. Love your enemies. Okay, somebody that I was going to fight with or something. But it's much more subtle than that. And we don't have to be Tibetan masters to do it. He says that if one situation loses its power to upset you, the path is opened before you in order that someday no situation may disturb you interiorly anymore. Like, wow, that's profound. If you set a precedent, like a legal precedent, I can turn this around toward the unfriendly or unfavorable aspects of life. This morning it was raining. What does it have to be this? I'm not saying that I'm going to be in denial and jump up and down and run down the street out my front door and do that. But I can work with this attitude without denying what feelings are actually coming up and without suppressing them. I can have those feelings and then do a turnaround. Not the same thing as suppressing with denying it and pretending that you don't feel this. Because you do. I remember this statement, I don't have it exactly right, by Nisargadatta Maharaj, one of the great non-dualists of the last century, a pretty extraordinary human being. I remember reading his book, I Am That, back in the 70s when I was just getting involved on the path, and I was just blown away by it. And he said something like, nothing ever goes wrong in my world. Like, wow. Last point, love is calculation. What? He says, if there's one domain in which we must not calculate, we think it's love. That's an arena that should never be calculated in. We just instinctively relate to it. But he says that Swami Prajnanpad said this, and that it means to think about what we do and what will be the result of it. What will be useful for this person? What would be useful for me in relating to this staff person that ignores me? If I think about her instead of, oh, I need to assert myself and say how I'm feeling about this, which is I don't feel respected. Well, maybe that would be the right thing to say in some situations. But maybe if I calculate this, that's not going to be heard well. Maybe there's a better way. Every situation is different, and we do our calculations. He uses the example of bringing home flowers for your partner. And they tell you that they don't like carnations, but that's what you bring them because they're cheap. I used to do stuff like that. You know, I'd get flowers, but I'd get the kind of flowers I wanted to get. This didn't make any sense to me to spend $12 on a couple of flowers that are going to be dead before the end of the week. But that's what she liked. That's what she liked. What's my calculation? It was a bad calculation. I'm going to buy these four carnations for a buck each. He talks about three budgets of money, time, and energy. This also applied to me. It's like he was writing this book for me. If you spend so much of your time at work because you want to make more money, and then that would make things easier for your family, okay, you can calculate it that way. But if you spend more time at work, then you're spending less time with your family. And is that worth it? Maybe not. 
He says that ego calculates very selfishly from morning till night. Oh, yeah. That's something to observe. The path starts with a clear view of our egocentrism and our selfishness. But he says that in a way that's not shaming. That's just what is. Can you see that? Can you see the childish parts of ourselves and acknowledge it, but just realize that's what it is to be an unconscious human being? If I want to be more, I can work with this. He says, this is also from Swami Prashnapad, that we evolve from only me, which is the attitude of the world, the cultural disposition. We evolve from only me to me and others. We go out a little bit and expand ourselves to others and me. And he says, there's an astonishing criterion to know if our calculation is right. Am I perfectly at peace? This might seem like a selfish way of assessing if our calculation is right because it's about my own peace, but that's the indication. If I'm perfectly at peace, then I've taken right action. So what's some calculation that you could make about how to relate to somebody that will help you to stay in love? I would say stay in love with them, but it's bigger than that. It starts there, but it's to stay in love, in the state of love. With my daughter, my calculation is not to give advice, better not to give advice. She's doing fine. She's finding her way. And if she wants to talk, which she does sometimes, she brings it up. If I bring it up, it's a little different. So a calculation for me is most times to wait. So one of the things that my teacher, Lee Lozowick, said was that love never dies if it's really love. And that's something to weigh also. If we're feeling like we're in love or we're loving someone or we're really expecting love from someone else or wanting love from someone else. Again, it's not a bad thing, not a judgmental thing about it, but is that really love? He's saying that love that's not stable and permanent isn't really love. And that that's the possibility that we have as human beings is to live from that stable state of love. Maybe everything else is secondary. So do we want to work toward embodying love as a stable state of being? Do we want that? To me, that's a really key question on the path. And if we do, or we say that we do, it seems like you have the secret or no sense. This is what we have to do. To love our enemies, to make this kind of turnaround toward others that we have an unloving attitude toward and toward the unfavorable or unfriendly sides of life. This is really challenging. So to me, it's not surprising that the spiritual scene is what it is. We would like to transcend these things so we don't have to deal with them so much. But I don't think that that's where the transformation is. How do you feel about this? Depressed? I do. <laughs> but I'm trying to do a turnaround about that. You said you were actually in the presence of Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. Yeah, and it like blew you away. Being in that state of love where you could impact people around you, where they would feel that and they would feel just healed just by being in your presence. And I know that type of being is not focused on, I am doing this, that type of love. To me, that is the goal. And it might feel minuscule every time we make a step that way, if you compare it to how it maybe could be someday. But every step leads you closer to that state of being permanently, that state of love. I see this as a permanent I, using different language. 
I think that a permanent state of love is synonymous with being one with. Yes. Because you can't help but be in that state if you're one with that. And this is a stable, permanent condition of I am love. And you have a name and a personality. And that's all pretty paradoxical and hard to linearly comprehend. But it may also be the truth. And it can be reliant on different traditions. But people who have chosen to be teachers and to reside in that state more permanently, it is more permanent. And I don't know if it has to do with what they've chosen to do. I don't know if you choose that or whether you're chosen. Swami and Prajnanpad told or no, because he could see that that was his calling. It might not be everyone's calling. In the traditions, there are saints like Mirabai, who wasn't the teacher, or Rabaya, who wasn't the teacher in the Sufi tradition, but they resided in that state, it seems. And being a teacher is a role, a function that I don't know that anyone would really want. Jesus? Oh my God. What burden or what obligation somebody has in that situation is hard to comprehend. Thankfully, we don't have to decide about that. We're thrown to be who we're thrown to be, and how things show up for us is unique to us. It is. (laughs) Time for a song? I have two songs to play, and thanks for considering this, I think, essential teaching that can make some difference in our lives. Okay, here we go. so deeply you can't tell one another apart and do you want to surrender feel all that you can do you want her to look at you like you are completely her man men see Shows of heaven to find their way back home again. Look into the eyes of lovers, into the hearts of friends. In the depths of all there is, the answer is plain as day. We must lose ourselves completely. That's all there is to say That's all there is to say And take time that you did not steal Do you want to feel the magic In each and every breath Or would you reach beyond the stars To laugh in the face of death Men seek the shores of heaven Find their way back home again Look into the eyes of lovers Into the hearts of friends And in the depths of all there is The answer's plain as day 
And we must lose ourselves completely And that's all there is to say And that's all there is to say Shores of heaven find their way back home again. Look into the eyes of lovers, into the hearts of friends, and in the depths of all there is, the answer's plain as day. But we must lose ourselves completely, and that's all. There is to say, that's all there is to say. You are 
my mind.